Take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows trim, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is all Darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, lead me on, help me stand, for I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are a Christ-centered family of God's people, growing in faith, caring for each other, bringing others to Christ, and ministering to the needs of our changing community and world. As we gather together this day, I have two announcements. Next Saturday uh, at 10 o'clock a.m. will be the celebration of the life and resurrection of our own Pastor Ron Camp. And for those not able to join us in worship, we are recording the service and it will be available on YouTube and through our church website, BeaumontPresbyterianChurch.com, just as are these uh, messages, and on the church Facebook as well. We give thanks for Pastor Ron's life and for his resurrection. And next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It'll be a little bit subdued compared to our normal Palm Sundays, but it will be the day that we officially reopen. Now, we never stopped having services, even for one Sunday, but we had outdoor church, social hall church, informal church, and just smaller gatherings. Next Sunday, we hope that more will come back, and that's the indication I have. And uh, we'll still social distance, wear our masks. We won't be singing yet, uh, but, uh, but more people should be back with us in worship. However, we will also continue with our online messages uh, this week and until Jesus returns for our online family. Who are unable to make it to church and those who are further away in other parts of the state nation and world now 
I was thinking of a couple things before I read the scripture. And one was uh, their back. Now, who, who, who's back? I have an image in my mind. Let me expand. My wife uh, feeds a lot of birds, and mainly hummingbirds, but also all sorts of other birds. And uh, hummingbirds are not the only ones that like the, uh, the sugar water that my wife cooks and, and puts out there. It also attracts orioles. And the orioles had been gone down to Mexico during the winter months. And, uh, but my wife has been putting out the Oriole feeder with some grape jelly and orange slices and pieces of banana. And guess who's back? My wife's Orioles. They made it all the way from deep in Mexico to our backyard. And these birds are beautiful. They've gotten a little bit bigger. They ate well down south. Uh, they have flaming orange uh, feathers with a little bit of black on the face and the wings. And uh, it, it just was a nice feeling to see their back. Uh, they made it back to our home, their northern home. It, it makes me, I wasn't going to mention this, but a pastor on in Maryland, I often would say how they were on their southern migration when they would come from Washington State to be with us down here in the cooler months. And one time they let me know they no longer were migrating, they had landed here and bought a home. Uh, and that was a great thing for our church. But it was a nice feeling just uh, to see the Orioles are back. They returned. Another thing I was thinking about during the Super Bowl, one of the commercials I was intrigued by, and I was looking up a little bit, but we learned that at the very center of the 48 states, the lower 48 states, at the very center in Lebanon, Kansas, of our nation, is the center chapel. The middle of our country is a chapel, probably big enough to hold about eight adults. Not, not very large, but in that chapel, uh, there's a tiny little pulpit, some little pews, each pew sits one person, one adult. They have a, a basket with free crosses you can take. They have a Bible where you can mark your favorite passages. They have a place where you can submit your prayer requests. And, uh, and they also have some literature, including the upper room devotionals, just as we have here in our church, and uh, with a, a daily devotional reading and scripture. And the, the center chapel at the center of the United States, of the lower 48 states at least, uh, it never closes. And everyone and anyone is always more than welcome. And I like the thought of that, that at the center of our 48 uh, contiguous states is, is a chapel uh, with a cross on the top dedicated to the Lord. And people from far and wide can spend a moment there in prayer and reflection. Now, the scripture for this morning, in the scripture, the Apostle Paul is telling us the good news of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and that through Christ, we are resurrected as well. The central fact of Christianity is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Uh, if it all ended at the cross, there would be no good news to share. Jesus just would have been an exceptional good man, the, the best man, but there'd be nothing else. There'd be no church. There'd be no hope for real life on this earth and eternal life in heaven and forgiveness and, and blessings from God. And so just like that chapel, the center chapel is at the center of our nation. The center of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to pay the price for our sins and reunite us with God. In our, our scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses three through four, reading this morning from the New Revised Standard Version. 1 Corinthians 15, three through four, from the NRSV. Paul says, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried 
and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. May God bless this reading of scripture. Paul says, for I handed on to you as of first importance, as of greatest importance, the most importance, he handed on what he in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. In these two verses, Paul summarizes what Jesus did in three statements. Number one, that Christ died for our sins. Number two, that he was buried. He really died. He fully died. He died completely. And number three, he rose again. And some scholars believe that these verses were an ancient confession of faith, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. In verse 14, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. In verse 20, Paul says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Paul is very clear. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then nobody else would have risen from the dead either, and there would be no resurrection. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a fact, then the whole Christian message is based on a lie. But then in verse 20, Paul affirms that Christ was in fact risen from the dead. He says in part, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. What does the resurrection mean for us? I was thinking of four things. Number one, that truth is stronger than falsehood. Now, it's so important to hold on to this day when, when sometimes uh, people figure they can get whatever they want through a loophole. Or, or a, but truth is stronger than falsehood. In John 8, 40, Jesus said to some of the Pharisees who were challenging him, As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth I have heard from God. Jesus' enemies did not want their false views destroyed, uh, but killing Christ was like blowing on a dandelion. He rose again, and his message of truth spread like wildfire. Uh, you kill Christ, he comes back all the stronger. But truth is stronger than falsehood. It may not always seem that way, but in the end it is. Also, uh, the resurrection means for us, number two, that good is stronger than evil. We need to remind ourselves of that sometimes in the world when we listen to the news and see what's going on around us. In John 8, 44, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. So evil men sought to destroy Christ, but good is stronger than evil. For in, in, in the end, God will vindicate the good. So truth is stronger than falsehood, and good is stronger than evil. And all things will be made right in God's timing. Number three, the resurrection proves that love is stronger than hatred. In Romans chapter 8, the scripture says in part, Paul says, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation shall separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the love of God is stronger than any foe that is uh, assailed against us. And so love is stronger than hatred. If there was no resurrection, then the hatred of men would have conquered the love of God. The resurrection is a triumph 
over all that hatred could do. Love is stronger than hatred. These words are encouraging when we find ourselves uh, in the fires of life, in the furnace of life, or in the valley of the shadow of darkness and death, in the lowest and difficult moments, to know that, that goodness and truth and, and love are stronger than, than, than evil and, and falsehood and, and hatred. And number four, life is stronger than death. If Jesus never died and rose again, then uh, it would prove that death was the final answer. That death is the last word, the greatest power and the ultimate ending for everyone. But for us, for us, death is not the end, but only the beginning. Jesus said in uh, John 11, 25 to 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me shall live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In a spiritual sense, will never die. Paul is very clear. Our individual souls and personalities will one day remain in paradise. We'll have new bodies, heavenly bodies, to replace our earthly bodies. How will our heavenly body be different from our earthly body? Again, uh, four things. Number one, these bodies we have now, they wear out. Uh, a couple of us on staff are, are limping for different reasons, uh, but temporarily, we, we can get back to the things we like, like to do, but, but these bodies that we have, they, they have their aches and pains and their shortcomings, and, and uh, you, you never know what you're going to find. Our daughter had a health scare recently, and what did my cousin call it? Uh, an incidental Ola, where they were uh, doing a CAT scan for something else, and then they found something else in there. So it's an incidental Ola, or something like that. But uh, uh, everything worked out with that. But we've got things going wrong all the time. I, all the, the, our cells are constantly dying. and uh, So these earthly bodies wear out. The difference, our heavenly body will last forever. That's amazing to think. Uh, amazing to think. I'm trusting the heavenly body will be a little more slender and uh, maybe won't sunburn quite as much or something like that, but, uh, but somehow the heavenly body will last forever. I was just thinking, I, I learned in a sociology class at San Diego State University long, long ago uh, when I was a student there, the, the professor was from Spain, but she talked about some different products that initially lasted years and years and years and years. But then the companies that made them uh, changed how they made them so they would uh, only last a year or two and then wear out and need to be replaced. And I think it was called planned obsolescence. Like how we have items now that they break down a couple days after the warranty runs out. A lot of things don't need to break down as soon as they do, but plan obsolescence so that we'll buy again. Uh, but our, our heavenly bodies will not wear out, they'll last forever. Uh, number two, our earthly bodies are prone to sin uh, with our, our, the things we say and do and even our desires. We each day either fall into sin or willfully choose sin from Adam and Eve grabbing that apple uh, and onto these days. Uh, but our, our future heavenly bodies will not be tempted by the flesh. And they'll no longer be servants to temptation, but instruments in pure service to God. And uh, that'll be an amazing difference. Now, number three, uh, these uh, our earthly bodies are weak. Uh, they don't last very long without... letting the motorcycle go by, uh, impressively loud. But our, um, our earthly bodies wither pretty quickly without water, and they don't last very long without air. But our heavenly bodies will be strong, and that will be a, a great thing. And number four, the difference, uh, our present bodies are a natural body, and our future bodies will be a spiritual body. I don't know exactly how that will look, but I know it will be amazing and wonderful. 
And we can, there's no night in heaven, so I guess we don't need to sleep. So we can feast, we can laugh and sing and dance and, and fellowship and praise and, and enjoy life in God's presence. Now, Paul says some beautiful words in verses 55 through 57 beyond our scripture reading this morning. He says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking of a story someone shared with me many years ago. A father and his young son were having a nice drive out in the countryside, uh, down a country road, uh, early one morning in the spring. And then the little boy shuddered in terror as a bee flew in the open car window because he was deathly allergic to bees. And his father, uh, holding onto the steering wheel, held on with his left uh, uh, hand and released his right hand and reached out and grabbed the bee in his hand and, and held it, squeezed. The son uh, was a little bit relieved, but then he, he drew back in terror again as his father opened his hand. And the father said, don't worry. You don't need to be afraid. Look, the bee is dead. And the stinger, he pointed to it, was still in his father's flesh. And he said, the bee can't hurt you. I took the sting for you. I took the sting of death for you. And this is the message of the resurrection. We do not need to be afraid of the sting of death anymore. Christ faced death for us, and by his glory, we are saved from sin because Christ has taken the sting. 1 Corinthians 15.55 asks, Where, O death, is your sting? And Christ took the sting for us. Death, the scripture says, has been swallowed up in victory. Christ has risen, fear is gone, and new life is ours. Paul concludes with chapter 58, where he says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul reminds us that what we do for Christ is never in vain, and that's the good news. Someone once said, being a Christian, it's a tough job but the retirement benefits can't be beat. It's a tough job, but the retirement benefits can't be beat. We get a new spiritual body and an eternity in heaven. On the last day of her life, a dear old saint of God lay on her deathbed. Someone asked, how are you doing? She replied, I'm almost well, I like that sentiment. Death might be scary for us, and I, I've known people that had come to the point where they were ready to be with the Lord, be with loved ones, uh, but uh, on faith we know that on the other side, it's going to be beyond all description, more wonderful than we can imagine. Now, Paul was a Pharisee, and he was an expert in, in the law, in the Old Testament books of Scripture, and, and, he, and yet he tells us in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain and your faith is in vain. He's saying that everything rests on whether or not Christ rose from the dead. So what happened? On the third day, Jesus came back. I got excited that the Orioles have returned, but a quadrillion times more important, and even more than that, is that Jesus came back. He didn't just die forever, he came back. And he came back for us. And that's the good news of the gospel. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the center of our faith. That's what our scripture tells us this morning. And then Paul goes on to say that our labors in Christ are not in vain. 
And Jesus gave us one labor in John 13, 34 through 35. Jesus says, as I have loved you, love others. And then the people will know that you are my followers. Our faith is not in vain. Jesus rose from the dead, just like the center chapel in the center of our uh, 48 states. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the center of our faith. And uh, our faith is not in vain. And we have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with others. And whatever we do to share that love is not in vain either, but it serves our Lord. And it's a joy to be servants of our Lord until that day we see him face to face in the life to come. Amen. Let us look to God in a word of prayer, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us now pray. We thank you, God, for this day. We give you thanks for the blessings of our lives. We give you thanks for the things that we are looking forward to. And we ask that you, you guide us and keep us. Help us to be ever mindful that no matter what happens in this life, even in the lowest times, the times of greatest suffering and tragedy and fear and worry and anxiety, help us to hold on to the fact that Christ died, was buried, but did not stay buried. He rose again. He came back. And that through Christ we have new life on earth and eternal life one day in heaven. That's the center of our faith and that makes all the difference. And we give you thanks that our labors in Christ are not in vain. We may one day bring in the harvest and see the results of our efforts. Other times we just labor in the vineyard and do our part and do what we can to share words of kindness and deeds of mercy and, and prayers of intercession, trusting and hoping and knowing that you're working behind the scenes and in hearts to bring in your harvest. Thank you for all that we have. And we ask that you be with us now as we join together in the prayer your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>